For the first time in 18 years, the New York Giants found themselves under the spotlight of the NFL playoffs, facing the Philadelphia Eagles. Although many New York fans showed visible signs of stage fright when the curtain went up, the Giants performed like a successful Broadway show held over by public demand. An early first period Eagle fumble recovered by New York was caused by all pro rookie sensation Lawrence Taylor number 56, typifying the aggressive opportunistic style of play that earned the Giants the wild card spot. The turnover set up New York's first score as quarterback Scott Bruner found Leon Bright all alone in the end zone. At the end of the regular season, the giant offense was ranked last in the NFC, while the Eagles defense maintained the league's number one spot. But the playoffs are the beginning of a new season. And on Sunday, New York ignored the rankings and proceeded to dominate pro football's finest defense. Using Rob Carpenter, number 26, Bruner moved the Giants with little trouble and threw his second touchdown pass to John Missler, number 85, to make the score 13 to nothing. On the ensuing kickoff, while the Eagles were busy shaking their heads and rubbing their eyes hoping it was all a dream, the Giants assured Philadelphia that they were, in fact, experiencing a real live nightmare. Number 89, returner Wally Henry, who endured a season full of anguish in just one game, fumbled his second kick. This one recovered in the end zone for a touchdown by Mark Haynes, number 36. The score put New York on top 20 to nothing and totally stunned Veterans Stadium as well as the Eagles, who had yet to even make a first down. In a matchup that would supposedly feature two of the game's best defenses, only the Giants lived up to their billing. New York's speed and pursuit shut down Philadelphia's vaunted rushing attack, leaving quarterback Ron Jaworski only one alternative. And in the NFL, a predictable offense is, in most cases, a defender's paradise. Unable to move the ball offensively, the Eagle defense finally emerged to give Philadelphia a much-needed boost. Number 46, Herman Edwards' interception provided the offense with their best field position of the game. And Jaworski capitalized on the opportunity with a touchdown to Harold Carmichael, number 17. The Giants' pass defense is keyed by their blitzing linebackers. And another look at the play shows that by successfully picking up blitzing Harry Carson, number 53, the defense became vulnerable. The touchdown closed the score to 20 to 7. However, New York came right back as Bruner threw his one and only first down pass of the game for a touchdown to Tom Mullody, number 81. The touchdown was Bruner's third, lifting New York to a surprising 27 to 7 halftime lead. The Giants seemed well in control of their biggest game in nearly two decades. The sleepwalking Eagles simply wanted to wake and find that the first half never really happened. 
Trailing 27 to 7, Philadelphia faced a Giants defense that had held opponents to only one touchdown in four of their last five games. The Eagles needed to unleash the heavy artillery. Instead, they sent number 31 Wilbert Montgomery on short, safe missions into New York's well-guarded territory. The strategy was effective, although Montgomery took his usual physical beating. Inside the Giants' 25-yard line, he ran five straight times. The fifth time, Montgomery shattered New York's fortress, scoring from six yards to cut the Giants' lead to 27 to 14. The touchdown showed Montgomery at his best. He used his quickness to avoid the first defender, then his strength to get into the end zone. It took Philadelphia eight minutes to score. The pressure was now on the Eagles' defense to shut down New York's offense. Rob Carpenter was New York's offense. A strong cutback runner, Carpenter, number 26, took advantage of Philadelphia's tendency to over-pursue. On this play, Al Chesley, number 59, Bernard Wilson, number 22, and Frank LaMaster, number 55, all reacted aggressively to the offensive flow allowing Carpenter to cut back inside of Philadelphia's over-pursuit. From his running back position, Carpenter dominated the game against the NFL's number one defense. One second half stretch, Carpenter handled the ball on 17 of 18 plays. The former Oiler carried the ball so much, you'd have thought he was Earl Campbell. Giants did not score, but Carpenter's punishing running kept the ball away from Philadelphia for three and four minutes at a time. With six minutes left in the game, the Eagles still trailed 27 to 14. Philadelphia had not come from behind to win in the second half all season. Against the Giants, the Eagles did flash bits and pieces of offensive firepower. But the Eagles are not really a comeback team. Their offense is precise, geared to gouging out yardage in small chunks, not large pieces. Forced to play catch up in a hurry, Ron Jaworski threw an interception, but the Eagles were granted a reprieve. A pass interference call against New York gave the Eagles their last scoring opportunity. But again, the big play eluded them. Another Giants penalty set up Montgomery's second touchdown of the half, but it came with less than three minutes remaining in the game. New York's 27 to 21 lead was placed in the hands of who else but number 26, Rob Carpenter. Carpenter ran four consecutive times for 28 yards and the two first downs that sealed Philadelphia's fate and gave the Giants the victory. Carpenter finished with 161 yards on 33 carries, 
The Eagles knew Carpenter was going to run, but they couldn't stop him. In the end, that was the difference. No one expected the Giants' offense to be able to push Philadelphia's defense around, but the Eagles staggered to the ropes, weary from the constant pounding inflicted by Carpenter and his mates. The decision was unanimous. New York 27, Philadelphia 21. For the New York Jets, Sunday had been a long time coming. Not since the 1969 season when the Jets were generaled by Joe Namath have New York's Green Berets engaged in playoff battle. In 1981, the Jets resembled that army of old by winning with passing and strong defense. But when they received the opening kickoff, Shea Stadium must have felt like Dunkirk. Buffalo's number 26, Charles Romes, converted a Bruce Harper fumble into a touchdown. And before 17 seconds had elapsed, the Bills were ahead of the Jets by seven. In the season opener, early game domination led the Bills to a 31 to nothing romp over the Jets. But New York rebounded with nine wins in their last 11 games. With Richard Todd throwing brilliantly in the clutch, the Jets hope for more of the same in the playoffs. Unfortunately for Todd and the Jets, they faced a Buffalo defense that allowed the fewest passing yards in the AFC. By shuffling as many as six defensive backs into the lineup, Buffalo forced Todd to throw into difficult coverage. And number 28, Rufus Bess, came away with one of two Bills interceptions in the first half. Like the Jets, the Bills are also a team that has succeeded behind their quarterback as Buffalo's Joe Ferguson set a team record with 3,600 yards in 1981. With the Bill defense affording him numerous possessions, Ferguson immediately took to the air. Ferguson connected on 12 of his first 15 tosses, and with speedsters like number 82 Frank Lewis in the lineup, short patterns can turn into 50-yard touchdowns. Lewis gave Buffalo their second touchdown by finding the seam in the secondary, and then exploding by his competition. Ferguson consistently aimed for the veteran Lewis, whose 11 pro years equals the experience compiled by the entire starting Jet secondary. Like the Bills, the Jets threw to their speedy receiver, Wesley Walker, but that lofty plan quickly crashed to earth. Walker's drop pass denied the Jets a scoring opportunity, and Jet misfortune also arose on defense. Number 99, Mark Gastineau, is a major stockholder in the New York Sack Exchange whose fierce pass rush challenged the solid walls of Fort Knox. Gastineau did manage to get to Ferguson, but instead of falling on top of the ball, Gastineau unwisely tried to take the ball on the run. For New York, the first half was a dirge as the Jets consistently squandered away opportunities. Meanwhile, the Bills simply moved along, singing that cheery refrain, Ferguson to Lewis. Lewis grabbed seven passes for 158 yards, and his second touchdown boosted the Bills to a shocking 24 to nothing lead by the middle of the second quarter. Fans feared a blowout, but those skeptics showed little faith in the comeback spirit that got New York to the playoffs. Reserve tight end Mickey Schuler came in for injured Jerome Barkham, and Schuler's first catch of the season put the Jets on the scoreboard. With Richard Todd drawing in the Bills secondary with a pump fake, Schuler beat single coverage. Schuler's touchdown made the score 24 to seven with two minutes left in the first half. But instead of running out the clock, Buffalo elected to try for another score. A decision Jet linebacker Greg Buttle made regrettable. 
Buttle's interception brought the ball to the Buffalo's 16 and gave the Jets an opportunity to get back into contention. The Jet offense was stonewalled on the next two plays. And on third down, Todd again tested the Bills with his reserve tight end. Todd's pass was just inches off the mark, and the Jets were forced to settle for a field goal. New York went into halftime trailing by two touchdowns. But with 30 minutes and playoff elimination left in the balance, the Jets were in need of their greatest comeback in this comeback season. For the first half of play, Joe Ferguson's 211 yards passing had taken advantage of three Jet turnovers and built a 14-point Buffalo lead. The obvious strategy, stick with what you do best, put the ball in the air. But an aroused New York pass rush turned the turnover tables the Jets' way. Ferguson succumbed to the pressure and delivered a belated Christmas gift to Jet cornerback Donald Dykes, number 26. It was Dyke's only interception of the year, but one of three interceptions Joe Ferguson threw in the second half. Nevertheless, number 12 insisted on throwing the ball and became a victim of the Jets' only second half sack by Joe Klecko, number 73. It was the New York Sack Exchange's final transaction of the season. New York held Buffalo scoreless in the third period while scoring three points of their own. But when the Bills got the ball back in the final quarter, they put the passing game on hold and went wide right with running back Joe Cribbs, number 20. Cribs used his speed to get outside, then won the 45-yard dash to the goal line to stretch the Bill lead to 31 to 13. When many Jet fans staged a foot race to the parking lot, they missed a finish that shaped up as one of the great comebacks in playoff history. In the final 10 minutes, the Jets reeled off 30 plays to the Bills' seven. One from Richard Todd to Bobby Jones, number 89. The 30-yard touchdown pass cut the Buffalo lead to 31 to 20 with seven minutes remaining. New York scored quickly on their next possession. Instrumental in the drive, tight end Mickey Schuler, number 82. It was Schuler's best day as a pro. Six catches for 116 yards. The Jets covered 52 yards in eight plays. And a one-yard score by Kevin Long closed the gap to 31 to 27. When the Jet defense again forced the Bills to punt, Todd's offense took over for their final drive. On nine consecutive pass plays, the Jets drove to the Buffalo 27 when it appeared the game was over. An interception by strong safety Steve Freeman, number 22, was nullified by a holding penalty against the Bills, and the Jets were given another life. Two short completions brought the ball to the Buffalo 11, 
And just 11 seconds remain when Richard Todd dropped back to throw his last pass of 1981. Safety Bill Simpson made the big play when it had to be made, putting an end to the Jets' astonishing fourth quarter surge. Buffalo 31, New York 27. The Jets almost wrote a great American classic. For them, it was an unfinished novel. But the Bills liked the way it ended and plan a sequel this Sunday in Cincinnati where they take on the Bengals in the next chapter of the 1981 playoff story.